Now, Ralph Wardlaw was an amazing scholar, and and he and, and uh, Ewing were great friends. Ewing was a little older. Um, Wardlaw had entered the University of Glasgow at the age of 11. He went to college at the age of 11 in October 1791. Normally, school started in October. And you can remember that. That's when Alexander Campbell, uh, remember October 7th is when the ship wrecked and he barely got to go to uh, school. I think uh, school had already begun. They had already did matriculation. And so, but uh, Ewing uh, got uh, Campbell into the school, even though it, it was already after it began. But school would begin not in August or even September, but in October back then. But when Ralph Wardlaw, at the age of 11, entered uh, college, he was already a master of Greek and Latin. And then after he graduated from the University of Glasgow, he uh, went to a seminary, uh, the Berger Seminary, that's a, a faction of the Church of Scotland, the Presbyterian churches, at uh, Selkirk. Uh, Lawson, uh, this, uh, Lawson was this teacher at uh, the seminary in uh, Selkirk, and he was a scholar of Hebrew and Greek. In fact, uh, the report in um, William Alexander's The Life of uh, Ralph Wardlaw, Memoirs, of the life and writings of Ralph Wardlaw was that uh, Lawson had memorized the entire Bible in Hebrew and in Greek. In his memoirs of his father, Elder Thomas Campbell, that's the title of the book, Alexander Campbell's writing about his father, writes the life of his father, Thomas Campbell. He says, I formed a very agreeable, indeed a very happy acquaintance with Dr. Greville Ewing and Dr. Wardlaw, very prominent actors among the Scotch independents. This is page 117. Ewing and Wardlaw had been close friends ever since uh, Wardlaw had left the Burger Seceder Presbyterian Church to join Ewing as a Congregationalist there in uh, Glasgow in 1800. Later in 1811, the two of them opened their own seminary. That was after uh, Campbell had left Glasgow in 1809. At the time, though, when, when uh, Campbell was there in Glasgow, uh, Ewing had left the Haldanian church and was over at the Albion Street Church with Wardlaw. And they, they weren't teaching in a seminary, but uh, Ewing had students over to his home all the time. Uh, Robert Haldane, right at the time that Alexander Campbell in mid-October entered Glasgow University, Robert Haldane joins his brother, James Alexander in rejecting infant baptism and sprinkling. And that really caused quite a stir. The Haldanes. This controversy between the Haldanes and Ewing also involved disagreements that Greville Ewing had with Robert Haldane involving the church property in Glasgow, the money that... Uh, Robert Haldane promised to pay Ewing for being the preacher there. The situation became very bitter and heated. In fact, they both published books about it, uh, being critical of each other. And these books were published and actually being written uh, where when Alexander Campbell was there. And it's mentioned uh, in... Uh, uh, the writing of uh, Robert Richardson on the life of Alexander Campbell. Now, just as this controversy was reaching its white heat, that was when Ewing was befriending the Campbell family and helping Alexander get into the uh, university there in Glasgow. And Ewing was uh, always inviting Alexander to his home, 
Uh, he had a lot of other students from the university to his house. Like I said, he was no longer teaching in the seminary. Uh, Robert Haldane had moved that back to Edinburgh. But but he was a good teacher, and he, he really befriended a lot of students. He was always having uh, people come, him and Wardlaw both. They were very well known in Scotland. They were always having guest preachers come, and uh, Ewing would have them stay in his house, and uh, he would have them meet with students. And a lot of them then, they would discuss questions. A lot of this is mentioned not only by Robert Richardson, by, but by other um, the. the uh, Alexander Haldane, who wrote the memoirs of Robert and, and his father, James Alexander Haldane. Um, by Alexander, who wrote the life of Ralph Wardlaw. Uh, Matheson, the daughter of Ewing, wrote uh, the life of her father, Greville Ewing. You can find references. Again, they're all in the chap my chapter in the lectureship book. But uh, Ewing was always inviting these guest preachers to town and had them in his home, and he'd have students come over like Alexander Campbell, and they would debate questions and talk about questions. And this is how Campbell learned about the teachings of Glass and Sandeman and Ewing about the questions involving uh, what the Bible really taught about just following the New Testament. Even about the, the fact that we're no longer under the Old Testament, but we're under the New Testament. This was something uh, that uh, uh, Greville Ewing even wrote a book on it and had it published. Uh, so all these questions. And then Alexander Campbell, of course, felt very obligated to Ewing for helping him get into the university, helping his family, helping him financially. So uh, 20 years later, after the 1808 controversy over infant baptism and sprinkling, Alexander Campbell writes a statement in the Christian Baptist. This is April 3rd, 1826. And, he, and Alexander Campbell uh, recalls that he was much prejudiced against James Alexander Haldane and his belief that immersion was the only valid form of baptism. Owing, Campbell says, to my connection with those who were engaged in a controversy with uh, Robert Haldane. Well, he's talking about Ewing and Wardlaw. That's who Campbell has in mind here. During his stay in Glasgow, Campbell had become convinced by Ewing that infant baptism and sprinkling were authorized in Scripture. I mean, he was hearing about this controversy between Ewing and the Haldanes all the time. And I think, uh, you know, Campbell says he was convinced and even prejudiced against the notion that only immersion was the valid form of baptism. Now, once Campbell got here in America, he, he was rejoined with his father, Thomas, this prejudice that he had against baptism by immersion only turned to doubt. And finally, his own hesitation over the question of baptism, whether to baptize an infant or not, whether to, to baptize by sprinkling or only by immersion, this, this uh, nagging question finally broke with the birth of his first child in March after he'd been married and had his first child in March of 1812. So, uh, for three years, after they got there in the uh, United States of America in 1809, um, it was three years, nearly, uh, before uh, Campbell decided that baptism by sprinkling was unscrewed. And so on Wednesday, June the 2nd, 1812, Alexander Campbell was immersed along with his wife, his sister, Bryant, and Alexander Campbell's parents, Thomas Campbell and his wife. 
they were baptized in Buffalo Creek. Now, this was near where they lived in what is now the state of West Virginia. Back then, it was just Virginia. And uh, even years later, after this, after uh, the you know the reference there in the uh, Christian Baptist, even later when when he's now publishing the Millennial Harbinger, Campbell could never bring himself to oppose Ewing and Wardlaw on this question of. Uh, sprinkling. Now, Campbell was already debating it, and he proved from the New Testament that uh, the only valid form of baptism, according to the New Testament, was immersion. But he wrestled with the notion of uh, Ewing and Wardlaw, because Ewing and Wardlaw persisted in their belief that sprinkling was also a valid method of baptism. Notice, 20 years later, after the Christian Baptist in 1832, um, 20 years later now, after the baptism in 1812, Ewing and Wardlaw are attacked by a man called Alexander Carson. Alexander Carson even writes a book on baptism. And in the Millennial Harbinger, the year is 1832. Campbell uh, prints a review notice of this book by Carson. The uh, review notice comes from a periodical, the Christian Index. Campbell does not mention who the author is, but he simply quotes what this person says about this book by Carson. And remember, Carson is attacking the uh, view of Ewing and Wardlaw. And this unknown, unnamed writer, the editor of the Christian Index, says this is a powerful work, not calculated, however, to be popular. It's intended for the learned and by them should be read pedo-baptists and sprinklers, infant baptizers and sprinklers should read it and give up the question. Mr. Carson has demolished their last resort and left them in deplorable destitution of Scripture and reason for uh, their belief and practice. Carson, as I said, was a famous scholar. He was a Presbyterian minister in Ireland. But he switched over and became a Baptist when he started studying this question on uh, what is the proper mode or method of baptism. And he wrote a book and published it. And notice the title. Notice who he mentions in the title. The title of Carson's book, Baptism in Its Mode and Subjects Considered, and the Arguments of Mr. Ewing, and Dr. Wardlaw refuted. And so Campbell uh, mentions how in the Christian Index they're promoting this book by Carson. And Carson is specifically singling out and attacking Ewing and Wardlaw. He is, this is the editor of the uh, Christian Index, uh, Carson's chief excellence consists in fixing and determining, by reference to classic usage in the Greek language, the very words on which the controversy over baptism must turn. These words are hunted out in many particulars. Their invariable import settled and defined beyond all possibility of question or evasion. And the whole dispute about the mode of baptism is thus reduced to a single point. We know not that we ever read an a piece of judicious, manly criticism. Mr. Carson is a Scotchman. You're going to learn in a minute. He's an Irishman, and Campbell knows him. And a minister of the gospel. He has had Mr. Ewing and Mr. Wardlaw in his sights, if you please, in his eye. 
throughout the performance. He's he's singling in on the arguments. Both Ewing and Wardlaw had written books defending uh, infant baptism by sprinkling. Sprinkling. These gentlemen had each made out an article in support of the fashionable error of infant sprinkling. They are imbecile, imbecile in the hands of Mr. Carson. Carson drives their theories and criticisms into confusion and forces into a dismal explosion all their fine conjectures. Now, uh, Campbell ends the quotation from the Christian Index, you know, it, bragging on this book by Carson. And now Campbell begins his remarks. Notice page 322 in uh, the Millennial Harbinger of 1832, July the 2nd, 1832. The editor of this paper, that's Campbell, he refers to himself in the third person. Having seen the three gentlemen above named, and having been intimately acquainted with two of them, Ewing and Wardlaw. He was very good friends with them. He knew them uh, and saw them on a daily basis. Back in 1808 and 1809, that year that he and his family were stranded in Glasgow, he got to know Ewing and Wardlaw very well, and they discussed the Bible together many times over the course of months, and uh, they got to be very good friends. He says, uh, it begs leave to say, he begs leave, please excuse me, Alexander Campbell, for saying, in further commendation of them, especially of Ewing, that Mr. Ewing and uh, Mr. Wardlaw, both Scotchmen and ministers in Glasgow, are the pastors of independent congregations. Mr. Carson, an Irishman, not a Scotchman, once a member of the Presbyterian Church, as were Mr. Ewing and Mr. Wardlaw, differs from the other two, Ewing and Wardlaw, only on the question of infant baptism. All three of the men are of the highest order as respects talents, education, moral, moral character, and all are equally able advocates for the weekly celebration of the Lord's Supper. It's actually... Uh, Ewing, who got that established in Scotland among the independent churches, the congregations over which they preside, Ewing and Wardlaw in, in the city of Glasgow, meet every Lord's Day to break the loaf, the, the Lord's Supper. And their arguments are as conclusive on that subject as Mr. Carson is represented to be on this darling Baptist concern, namely the mode of baptism. Now notice a bit of sarcasm here that's quite uncharacteristic of Alexander Campbell. This darling Baptist concern that, that baptism must be by immersion, well that's what Campbell himself has argued. He argued that in the debate with Walker. He argued that in the debate with McCullough, that's why he's gotten to be a household name. He's created such a controversy about it with uh, the, the movement, the restoration movement. But now when Ewing and Wardlaw are being attacked, Campbell goes back almost instinctively to defend them. And he's not thinking as he normally would. He's emotional about it because of his deep connection that he has with these men. That's why the Campbell of 1837 is inconsistent in 1837 with the Lunenburg letter, his reply. That's why he's inconsistent with the earlier Campbell back in the debate with McCullough. Here he is inconsistent in 1832. He can't bring himself to um, question um, Ewing and Wardlaw and whether they're Christians or not in the sense that, I mean, I leave all judgment to God. But 
uh, I'm going to teach what the New Testament says. I don't judge people. That's up to God. But I don't want anybody on Judgment Day, and I certainly don't want God, saying that I allowed, allowed people to be misled, especially people that I love. I don't want anybody uh, to be uh, misled uh, that I've, mis I've mistaught them in some way about how does a person get into Christ? How does a person receive the forgiveness of sins and become a Christian? And so I note uh, this sarcasm, this darling Baptist concern, which earlier Campbell uh, not only defended, but he became very well-known and famous as a result of the debates. And so five years later, in July 1837, in his reply to the Lunenburg Letter. Alexander Campbell cannot bring himself to question the status of those who have been sprinkled as infants and have never been immersed. Why? His great love and feelings of indebtedness for Ewing and Wardlaw. That's why he's inconsistent with what he really knows and has argued uh, from God's word. Campbell continued to cherish his friendship with them for the rest of his life. Whenever tragedy struck their lives, he was deeply saddened. And you'll notice in my chapter in the lectureship book, he makes references to them in the Christian Baptist and then later in the Millennial Harbinger. And most people who read uh, these passages they have no idea who Ewing and Wardlaw are, but notice that Campbell is very emotionally attached to these two men. He loves them very deeply. He feels very indebted to them. And indeed, on many points, he has learned the truth from them. In fact, during his visit uh, in 1847, Campbell here is much older. He rode several miles to Glasgow to see his old friend Wardlaw. That was before he had cell phones. So he couldn't call and make sure Wardlaw was there. He knew where he lived. He'd been in the home many times. And so Campbell wanted to see him one more time. But when he got there, uh, Wardlaw had left for a while with his family. He just happened not to catch him. Didn't cross paths with him. Like I said, didn't have a cell phone where you could call and find out where somebody was back then. So the whole trip, the whole ride up there and back was wasted. But uh, that was, you know, Campbell wanted to see his old friend again. He hadn't seen him in many years. I don't think you can overestimate the influence that Greville Ewing had on Alexander Campbell, and most of it was a good influence. Through their friendship and association together in Glasgow, Ewing had exposed Campbell to all of the basic questions that he himself would later address in his own restoration movement here in America. In the providence of God, Greville Ewing was there in Glasgow in the fall of 1808 at just the right time when a young Alexander Campbell and his family needed him most. And so the influence of Greville Ewing upon young Alexander Campbell. Uh, Ewing taught Campbell a lot about the Bible that later uh, became uh, prominent teachings in establishing the Restoration Movement, in restoring the New Testament Church. And Campbell, unlike Ewing and Wardlaw, went on to teach the truth on baptism and the proper mode of baptism. Ewing and Wardlaw never did. Uh, they had a block when it came to uh, immersion. They believed in infant baptism. They believed in sprinkling all their lives. And so there's a good influence, but yet I see a bad influence. And, I, and you have to blame Campbell, not uh, Ewing, for the bad influence. Campbell uh, deeply respected uh, Greville Ewing, loved him dearly, uh, 
loved Ralph Wardlaw, uh, knew they were good men, and they taught a lot of the truth that other people weren't teaching. Campbell learned a lot from them. But uh, Campbell uh, allowed his feelings about them uh, to, I think, later um, cloud his judgment about uh, people being Christians who had never been immersed in, by baptism. Uh, here uh, is the article that I wrote at the top of the slide on the men of Glasgow, the influences on upon the Campbells there in Glasgow. And in particular, not just at the university, but the influence of Greville Ewing and Ralph Wardlaw. This is an academic article um, with a lot of citations. Um, and you can, it supplements what I wrote in the lectureship book uh, for this year's uh, lectureship at uh, Northwest Florida School of Biblical Studies. And this is a picture of me back in 2009 when I was working uh, on this article. I got it published uh, back then in the Restoration Quarterly uh, in that year. And uh, again, uh, you know, Ewing was a great influence on Alexander Campbell. Uh, but uh, Campbell uh, hesitated and I think gave, uh, um, I think he gave a wrong uh, answer in the reply to the Lunenburg letter. Uh, I, I would not want anyone, I'm not going to judge people, I'm not going to condemn people. That's up to God. And once I teach someone, what the New Testament says, that you're baptized into Christ. That means before baptism, what's your relationship to Christ? If you're baptized into Christ, you've got to be outside of Christ uh, before baptism. You're still outside of Christ. And, um, you know, if a person doesn't want to accept that, uh, that's, that's their business. That's between them and God. Uh, you know, I leave the matter with God. But now I don't want God condemning me because I misled people on what the New Testament says. Uh, I don't, uh, uh, you know, make a judgment. That's not for me to make a judgment. It's up to God to make that judgment. But I think uh, the influence of uh, Greville Ewing uh, on uh, Campbell was a... Uh, was uh, very important for the Restoration Movement. And Campbell yet allowed himself, because of his great affection for Ewing and Wardlaw, he allowed his judgment, I think, to be, be clouded, where he gave mixed signals, like in his reply to the Lundenberg letter. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this lesson on uh, Greville Ewing and his influence. And uh, I think he was a very good man. And... Uh, uh, but uh, he he didn't ha didn't he didn't carry it all the full way uh, from what the New Testament says on the question of baptism. Campbell did that.